Tony, what do you say? Go for it? All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Metrican, the Rosalie and Jim Shane Curator and Director of the Arts at the Brandeis Women's Studies Research Center, Kinesnik Gallery. The WSRC advances knowledge, public dialogue, and social justice through interdisciplinary inquiry and the creative arts focused on women, gender, and sexuality. All of our programs, research, art, activism, and creativity is made possible through the support of generous donors. Please visit our giving page and consider making a donation to the WSRC to help us further our mission of gender equality in the world. Welcome to this program for Jamie Black's solo exhibition, Between Us, guest curated by Brandeis faculty, Tony Shapiro Pym. We're so happy to be with you all here in this space. Special thanks to the CAST program and the students of Intro to CAST, which have helped to make this exhibition possible. If you're interested in staying in touch, you can sign up for the WSRC and arts mailing lists, and I'll include these links and, and some others in the chat box. We have one more upcoming event for this exhibition, which is a Waltham Public Library Book Club meeting with Polly O. Walker. The event will be held in person at the gallery on January 24th, I think that's correct. Visit our webpage later for registration info. I'll go over a couple of protocols. Auto closed captioning will be generated during this event, which you can toggle on or off on your controls. And during the Q&A, you may submit your questions in the chat or raise your hand. This event is now being recorded and will be available later through our website. Okay, Tony and Jamie, thank you very much. And Tony, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Susan. Hi, everyone. It is a true honor to be sharing a Zoom platform with Jamie Black and to be collaborating with her on a presentation of her art here at Brandeis. Before I introduce Jamie and speak a bit about our work together, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Brandeis University occupies Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Pawtucket homelands and territories. We recognize that the very existence of our university in Waltham has been facilitated by the dispossession, enslavement, and dispersal of Native communities by settler colonialism. We also recognize that we must repair our relationships with local Native communities and with the land. We affirm that we want to hear Native narratives, build relationships with local communities and organizations, respect Native sovereignty and cultural rights, all with a sense of humility and sincere gratitude. Last spring, the Women's Studies Research Center here at Brandeis University approached me as the chair of the program in creativity, the arts and social transformation, asking if I'd like to curate an exhibition in their Kinesnik Gallery in the coming year. This was a gift, a perfect opportunity to reach out to Jamie Black, whose red dress project I had admired from afar for years and which I had introduced in several classes. The program in creativity, the arts and social transformation explores efforts where creativity, aesthetics and cultural expression intersect with social justice concerns. The Red Dress Project, which Jamie will describe momentarily, is immediate, urgent, stunning and heartrending, while also contemplative. It's a call for attention to the horrific and unconscionable violence committed against indigenous women and girls in North America and a call to action. It had a profound impact on many students, even when studying it just through videos and photographs, essays and interviews. What might be possible, I wondered, if we brought the Red Dress Project here onto campus? Jamie graciously accepted my invitation and she also offered more. Might she prepare an exhibition of photographs, poems, and video inside the gallery while guiding the students as they designed the installation of dresses outside across campus, she asked. So here we are. Between Us, an exhibition of Jamie's multimedia work is in the Kinesnik Gallery through February. I want to offer additional thanks to the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and the Department of Fine Arts for support of the exhibition and to the program in Peace Building and the Arts and programs in International Justice and Society for support of related events. As described by indigenous curator Jennifer Smith, who knows Jamie Black's art intimately and who wrote an essay about the exhibition currently in the gallery. 
um, I'll excerpt from her writing. Jamie Black's work represents our, that is indigenous women's presence. It is also about building and sustaining an emotional connection to the land, the earth, forest and waterways. Jamie's work from the Red Dress Project to actions on the land captured through photography are all acts of ceremony that connect her to the land, but also lay out a path to remind others to find their way to the land too, end quote. And I'll add that her photos, poems, and videos focus special attention on Indigenous women's potency. Their presence guides the future. Red dresses now dot the main pathway through our campus, active in the wind, alive with stories, while still communicating devastating loss. Students in the Introduction to Creativity, the Arts, and Social Transformation course designed the display with care and also created a resource page on the web for links to information and action and support related to violence against Indigenous women and gender-based violence in general. They are undertaking a publicity blitz about the exhibition and related programs. They created and participated in a ritual to welcome the dresses. They shot and edited a behind the scenes video that is in a corner of the gallery, a corner offered to us by Jamie for student responses to the context of her work. And they did more. Thank you, Jamie, for this opportunity to connect with you and your broader communities in these ways. Indeed, through Jamie, we started a relationship with the Native American Students Association of Wellesley College, who will host the Red Dress Project after Brandeis. Emma Slybeck, president of that association and a descendant of the Eastern Band of Cherokee, is here on campus with us today. We've approached this collaboration with you, Jamie, with humility, caution, respect, anger at the lived reality of racialized and gendered violence, heartbreak and compassion for those who are or feel unheard and unseen, and gratitude for this chance to learn and to amplify the messages and possibilities that your art creates. Jamie Black is a multidisciplinary artist of mixed Anishinaabe and Finnish descent based in Winnipeg, Canada. She's particularly interested in feminism and indigenous social justice and the possibilities for articulating linkages between and around both. Her Red Dress project has been featured in venues across Canada and the United States, including the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, and has been written up globally, including in Vogue, in The Guardian, and just this week, People Magazine, and will be included in an upcoming UNESCO publication. Jamie will answer questions after her presentation. Uh, you audience members will have a chance to place questions in the chat once the presentation is over. And Jamie, the floor is now yours. First, I will unmute me. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Tony. It's been so amazing. Um, and thank you all for coming to join us today. Um, it's, it's been such a pleasure working with Brandeis University and um, I've had such amazing support and I'm just, I mean, I'm here in Winnipeg and, you know, kind of working from home and all of this stuff is happening, you know, out beyond me. And so it's, it's really beautiful to see how the places where the dresses go, the community and the people are taking care of the dresses and, and just bringing, bringing together community and all these beautiful things are happening because of this work and, and um, the stories I hear about people's reactions to the dresses and are just so touching and it's it's amazing to kind of see work that I've been kind of building over 10 years kind of come come into these places and still have this strong effect and powerful effect on the community and bringing together community so I thank you both Susan Tony and everyone I've worked with at Brandeis for supporting this work um and for Emma as well from Wellesley, who has kind of become part of this circle as well. So it's it's really um, a really powerful thing about the red dresses is, is is they will create community and they continue to do that. Um, so I'll just start um, from the way the beginning. As I said, I started doing this work about ten years ago. So um, around two thousand nine, two thousand ten, um, I began putting up red dresses, and I I felt the need to do that because I felt like we, I was watching families and communities losing loved ones, but it, there was really a lot of um, 
impunity there was there was no one kind of like watching out for the families and no one taking care of the families and they were actually dealing with racism um as they were trying to look for support from places like um, the police force or other institutions that are meant to actually support us um if we could bring up the slideshow that would be awesome um but yeah, so I, you know, I decided I, I needed to do something as an artist and, and someone who, you know, really works through creativity. I wanted to be able to really bring through the voices of these families and put the issue of violence against Indigenous women on a more public stage because people were crying out, but no one was listening. Um, communities were working hard to get their voices heard and nobody was listening. And I was just racking my brain thinking about how I myself could help out in my own way to allow people's voices to be heard. Um, <clears throat> and I, I actually attended a conference in Germany around the time of the creation of this project. And at that conference, there were probably about nine or 10 um, academics studying indigenous culture in Canada and North America. And they're very interested in that. And so, you know, they're doing their research, years of research, um, and most of these people at this conference were non-Indigenous and most of them were men around this table. Um, there was one woman, Joanna Piscanu, from First Nations University here in Alberta and Canada that was present at that conference. And after they all gave their presentations, she stood up and she said there were over, at the time it was recorded, 500 missing and murdered Indigenous women across Canada. Um, and actually that number is quite small compared to the research that's been done now. Um, but when she said that, I, my mind just thought of red dresses, just red dresses everywhere. These dresses that people could, in public spaces where people could not ignore what was going on anymore. Um, and she really inspired me because I feel like it was so brave of her to stand up and tell the truth about what was happening here on our, in our nations. Um, and the truth of colonialism and the ongoing colonial violence that we are facing as communities here. <clears throat> and so I, I actually went and got a couple of dresses and just kind of started playing around with them and put them up outside and started photographing them. Um, and I made a connection with some professors of women's studies at the University of Winnipeg. And this photograph we're looking at here is the first installation of the Red Dress Project, I believe is in 2009 or 2010. And um, yeah, so I worked with the Women's and Gender Studies Department to create this installation. And I, at first I just wanted to put up a few dresses, but they really helped me create a framework for making a larger public installation. So we put a call out for dresses during the time of this. And we, in the first year of doing the Red Dress Project, I got over 300 donations of red dresses from all across North America, both Canada and the United States, um, as well as some from Europe. They were coming from everywhere and I kept gathering dresses. And so I feel like that aspect of the project really showed um, how the community was willing to support and stand by families and women through this and, and create solidarity and really work towards ending this colonial violence. Um, so that's one of the beautiful parts of this project. Um, <clears throat> uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so the work has been traveling all across Turtle Island, um, Canada, the United States for the last 10 years. So I probably have been doing six to eight exhibitions of the red dresses at different with different community groups, with universities and um, and different places all across Canada for all this time. So you can do the math. <laughs> and it's just, it's been a, a long, amazing journey and it's really building. And, and I think that this work really works to have people's voices heard in the here and now, in the present. And one of the things that, that really kind of 
is impactful about the dresses is that they're in public space. So I think using public space and being present in public spaces is really a reclaiming of presence and power, as well as a way to draw attention to violence against Indigenous women and girls. So um, I, these public spaces allow people who are perhaps not involved in, in the arts, perhaps not involved in any political um, issues, who perhaps have no knowledge of Indigenous people even, um, to encounter these dresses. And then they also allow families and people who are deeply affected by what is going on to also come into the same space and feel like they are cared for, feel like they have somewhere where they can tell their story, um, feel like they do not need to be silent and that they have allies and support. So they've really, really done such amazing work. And I, I feel like as an artist, I, I really have kind of been sort of the vehicle for this. And it's, it's work that I have been given as a gift and that I need to share and that it is my responsibility to share. Um, and I take that very seriously. And, and I feel like I, this work has also brought me on a journey um, personally myself of reconnecting to so many amazing Indigenous women all across Turtle Island over the years and um, really rediscovering my myself and my own connection to that lineage and my own family, um, which was silenced because of colonialism over the years as well. So it has been a really powerful personal journey um, and, it, and it continues. So um, just recently over the last probably three years, the dresses began to be installed in the United States. Um, Previous to that, they had been all across Canada and different places, but had never very much been in the United States. So um, the dresses were up at um, the Smithsonian in Washington, the National Museum of the American Indian, um, pardon me. And uh, after, after that, the word really started to spread around the United States. And I think it was really interesting because I was starting to feel as an artist that this work um, in Canada had sort of been done because I'd been doing it for such a long time and it really was working to raise the profile of the issues happening here on the ground. Um, and then also here in Canada, there was the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, which was uh, a government funded inquiry, I think independent inquiry um, to look into the the kind of frameworks and systems that were causing this violence to happen. Um, so really that the issues were really being raised here in Canada over the years and the public was having a much, a much broader sense of what was going on and it became much, much more public knowledge that Indigenous women and girls were just at such high risk in our country. Um, so after years of doing this work, I was kind of starting to feel like maybe, you know, it was time to, it was time to switch something. It was time to, to make a change. And um, one of the things I did was continue to show the dresses, but really to think about instead of the absence of women, acknowledging the absence, but also acknowledging the presence, the presence of all of us here, the presence of all the circles of people these dresses were gathering around them. Um, the presence of myself, of people like Tony, um, of people who are doing this work together to stand beside um, Indigenous women and their families and create change. And I think moving to that perspective and understanding um, the power um, the, and the presence of us gathering together was a really important way of framing of framing this work and creating that bit of change that I think was necessary um, in balancing out the violence, we are also speaking out against the violence. We are not passive victims. We are standing here today. We are doing this work together and we are not forgetting about what is, what is going on. And um, that was one of the necessary shifts that it took to continue to do this work and to really focus on um, the ways in which Indigenous women are making 
huge strides in creating change in their social and political environments. Um, yeah, and and yeah, so the dresses started moving. Um, you know, they went to Washington, and after that, it was it was kind of starting the conversation up in the United States. And I think that um, politically, um, you know, I think that Canada is definitely has a lot, um, you know, a lot to do in terms of reconciliation. We are not anywhere near. Um, an okay place for that because, um, you know, things are still happening. Land is still being taken away. All, all of these things that colonialism lives, it, it lives on, it continues. Um, but the public conversation and knowledge around Indigenous, um, Indigenous um, issues is, is really much more, I feel, here in Canada. So I think it was just really amazing that that the dresses just almost organically started to move towards the United States after a period of time where they had done the work they needed to do here. Um, and now they're beginning that work um, south of the border. And I think that work is so important. And I think it's always the first step of, of truth telling, of bringing those stories out from under the carpet, of speaking out about what's happening. Um, that's, that's really important. And I think that Canada kind of passed that threshold of truth telling where people were understood that. Um, but in the States, that's just beginning. And, and there's, there's so many people, uh, again, doing that work, but maybe not being listened to enough. Um, so this work really helps to raise the profile and raise the public awareness of, of things that are going on and things that Indigenous women are fighting for all across Turtle Island. Um, so I'm very excited that the work is is moving in that direction and and um, you know continuing to tell that story that I think needs to be told. Okay, we can go to the next slide, please. Pardon me, guys. It's very strange talking to the void, but I will continue to do it. And I know you guys aren't the void, but can't see ya. So. <laughs> um, I did also wanted to share this image because um, a, a quite a few years ago, probably five or six years ago now, I actually opened up the project for other people to, to take the initiative and other communities to take the initiative and put up red dresses in their own communities to support women and girls. So um, that just really blew up and people all across the nation started putting up red dresses in their businesses, putting up red dresses, their own installations of red dresses and parks and, and spaces around their homes and their own communities. Um, and this is just such a poignant example of that shift of the red dresses, um, not only as victims of violence, but also as very powerful presence of protecting um, women and the land. And so in this image we're looking at, oh my goodness, I believe it's from Wet'suwet'en which I believe is in British Columbia in Canada. I'm sorry, I'm bad at remembering details. Um, but basically this image is, is the red dresses standing guard, holding space um, to protect sacred land, unceded land of, of the people in this, in this area. And they have chosen to put up red dresses to show the importance of the, that land, the sacredness of that land. And I feel like these dresses have truly become almost like, almost like an army where we're all standing together. The spirits of these women are standing with us. They're watching us. They're, they're fighting beside us for justice. Um, so that's super powerful to see that, you know, the community really taking, you know, taking the strength and power of this work and, and using it to to have their voices heard and to continue to fight for, um, you know, what what is ours as Indigenous people. Thanks, we can switch the slide, please. Thanks. Oh, I kind of like went over all this already. <laughs> oh, no, you can go back, it's okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so this is, this is actually like a, 
uh, sort of a pivotal point. So kind of what I was talking about, like about shifting from understanding the red dress as a symbol of disempowerment or of only victimhood or only violence to it being a reclaiming of space, a reclaiming of ourself, a reclaiming of spirit. Um, and, and I was thinking about like, what does it mean to, to re-embody the red dress to where, you know, and where do we as Indigenous women and myself included, because this is my own personal journey as well, is like, where do I go to heal? Where do I go to to get my power back? Where does that happen for me? And I, you know, I thought about that. And for me, it's always been um, when I have a chance to be out on the land, that is where I can, I can rebalance myself, reconnect to myself, reconnect to that knowledge, um, you know, that our ancestors had, um, you know, and I really think of the land as my, it's almost like a, it's a spiritual connection. It's a spiritual interconnection. And so like when I think of, if I were to speak about um, religion or spirituality, I, I would say that I, I aim to live by what the land is asking for, what the land needs, what the land teaches. And I feel like that is the place where I go to connect to that spirit. And, um, you know, I put on, I put on this red garment and I also was thinking about dance as a way of reclaiming the body. The body is no longer what, what, um, you know, this colonial system, like, tries to impose certain things on women's bodies, like how they're supposed to look, how they're supposed to move, how, where they're supposed to be, all of that stuff. And this was just an act of, of reclaiming what, who we are through our bodies by moving just as we are feeling moved to move um, and, and resisting, um, resisting through that movement and through that joy and through that interconnection with the land and um this was this was definitely around the time i was thinking about um you know all of those things and and reclaiming that power and what does that look like and from this point on my work kind of began moving more and more towards this connection this connection to the land the connection to the body and how do we heal trauma through the body, through the land, through spending time on the land? Um, and that's kind of my work shift in that direction of healing and reconnecting and reclaiming from this, uh, from this moment on. So we can switch. Um, yeah, so I, what you'll see in the Kinesmic Gallery is um, a series of photographs I've been doing. I've been doing a lot of um, kind of live performance art, um, just actions in space. And so the photographic work that is in the gallery is our just kind of documentation of those actions and those, those performances. And I think of performance, I, it's really for me, it's about, as I was saying, like, really connecting with the land that is that is what I aim to do when I am when I'm doing this work it gives me time to create that intimacy and that connection and um, that is that's what I hope comes through um, in the photographs and the documentation of these actions out on the land um, this image was taken this summer um, I've been thinking a lot about water as well right now and how water, I mean, there's just so much. Um, firstly, our water, you know, is in danger. Um, you know, there are women, there are Indigenous women leading water walks uh, to protect the water. And that's a ceremonial walk where they walk thousands and thousands of kilometers um, around lake shores, around uh, beside rivers and different water bodies of water um, to protect the water. And so I've, you know, I've participated in a couple of those. I'm watching a lot of friends and people I know, community I know, doing those walks. And I, I really admire that, um, you know, just, just the power of women to lead that um, fight to protect what we all as humans need to survive. And that's the water. Um, I also am thinking about water as... Um, 
you know, as a spiritual element, as a healing element, as an emotional realm, um, all of those things. And I, I spent a lot of years with um, my grandfather, like out on his boat, and he was always fishing, he would fish like 11, 12 hours a day. So if you got in the boat at 5am, um, you weren't, you weren't getting home till probably around time it gets dark. So I spent lots of years doing that with him. And, and I, I really miss those years. So I, you know, I'm also looking for ways to kind of reconnect with him. And, and uh, he, he had a, he also had like a real intimacy with the land and the water. And he, he understood, you know, he, he went back to the same spots very frequently. And, you know, he was always hunting and fishing. And um, he, he just, developed a very intimate knowledge of the land in that way and it just was it was just second nature to him um, and I always really admired that and so I'm I think in a way doing this work and going back to the water is it is also a way of kind of reconnecting with that part of my family and that and that skill set that my grandfather had of of being able to read the water being able to connect with the water to understand how it how it moves and and it's a real intimacy and you get you get strength and power from that relationship from creating that relationship and understanding that you are as a human in relation to um you know the land and the water um so in this image i guess like i'm getting philosophical on you guys but um but in this image i'm holding a uh, red ribbon as you can see and i'm i I have used that ribbon in a couple of different ways before in other works of mine. And I'm really thinking of it as, it's almost like the water is our lifeblood, right? Um, the rivers are our veins. Um, this ribbon is, is kind of illustrating that and then also kind of showing that interconnection between my body and the body of water. Um, so in the, in the video, which is connected to this, um, I am bringing that ribbon from the land to the water and it's kind of becomes that interconnecting thread that um, between us. <laughs> and I just said the name of my show, oh. <laughs> which I didn't even mean to, but clearly that's why I called it that. Um, we can go to the next one, please. Thank you. Yeah, so I didn't know this one was in here. I always forget what I put in my slides. But I can speak to all of them because I, you know, I made them. So, um, yeah, this is an older one, but uh, this is one of the first times I actually used the ribbon in the water. And um, it was really special because it actually, I mean, I'm not a fisher person. I wish I was. Um, my grandfather was, but I just went with him. I wasn't, I wasn't really trained in it. But, uh, but yeah, putting this ribbon in the water was just like a really special experience. I could feel... I could feel the water by holding onto the end of the ribbon that was not in the water. And so you could feel the movement and see how the water is moving by putting that ribbon in there. And again, it's that interconnection and that, and that link between the water and the body. Um, Tony, did you want to speak at all to any of, any of these? Because I know like that one is in the gallery. So I'm just interested what what your thoughts are because also we have red ribbon in the gallery as well thanks jamie i'll just i mean the the exhibition just opened today but i can say that um, from student responses and others who have come through um, one of the first things they um, mention is the ribbon and especially the bundle of ribbon that you asked us to set between four dresses. So in the gallery, there are four dresses facing the cardinal directions. And uh, beneath each dress, there is a stone. And mm -hmm. in the center, um, there is a bundle of thick, luscious red ribbon with a light on it. So it... Um, Mm -hmm. It shines. Um, it's illuminated, and it's very striking when you walk into the gallery. And it's very um, uh, moving when you know, to hear you talk about the ribbon as the lifeblood, as 
veins and as these connections to everything else that is actually surrounding the dresses in the gallery, the photos, the videos that um, connect you, your body to the land. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tony. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I, I think like, I, so as Tony said, the ribbon, it's probably the same ribbon that was in this river and also the ribbon that was um, by that lake in the image we just seen. Um, I had sent it actually to Brandeis. So that ribbon is actually present in the gallery as well, physically, as well as being in many of the photographs in, um, in the gallery. So, um, so yeah, that ribbon just has a prominent place in, in my work. And I, I put it in the center of four red dresses. And I was almost, it's funny because I feel like in the context of the red dresses and it being in the middle I feel like those dresses are maybe the keepers of, of that lifeline, of that lifeblood. Um, and it's also an offering from me, <clears throat> pardon me, um, from me to the dresses. I wanted to offer that to the dresses. Um, another thing I think when I see that ribbon in the middle of those dresses, it's almost like a fire. Um, and I know that sort of like shifts the meaning a little bit, but I think it can be all of those things. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it's it's just that sacred element that's in the, that's holding everything together. And um, yeah, it's really powerful that it's in gallery. And I'm wish I could come see it. <laughs> um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this series is called um, They Tried to Bury Us. And again, in these images, I'm, I'm again going back to the land and going out on the land and, and just physically interacting with the land. And there's just something really amazing about, you know, physically touching the land because I, I feel like the land holds um, memory. It holds, and the same with water, um, which I didn't mention before, but but all of these elements hold memory. And I think, you know, the land is old, the water is old. And both of those things they remember before the onset of colonization, before, um, you know, patriarchal violence was a reality in our world. It, the land remembers when humans lived in balance with it, when we were connected and interdependent on the land. Um, and so it's there's just something so old and beautiful about, about trying to rekindle these interconnections within myself. And it's just like physically in the in the cells of just touching the land, um, I feel like, you know, I feel like I can connect to that to that energy. And so I'm kind of going to these spaces and and thinking about the history of these spaces, thinking about the history of our land, and um, and um, and making those connections. So, this was made in probably about two thousand seventeen, and it was near Banff. Um, and I was thinking about um, I was I was thinking about um, let me get there. Sorry. <laughs> I need to sink into it because I was in another place but um but I but yes I named this work they tried to bury us so it's really about um you know us being silenced as indigenous women us being they tried to bury us they they tried to burn the witches they like all the women who had knowledge and connection to the land they are trying to erase and I was thinking about that when I was doing this work. Um, I actually had a dream of this with the sticks over top of my face in the dream. And so that's that's why I went out and did it. But like often my work will, um, you know, I will have an image come up and I will recreate it. Um, but then these, this work becomes my teacher. Um, over the years that, that new meanings will come out of these works and so those are the things I was thinking when I was when I was creating this piece and um, it's it's especially poignant right now um, also because 
of what is going on here in Canada um, is the remains of Indigenous children are being unearthed all across the country right now. Um, and, you know, it's, I <laughs> apparently I'm at a loss for words because it's just beyond. Um, I think the number is up to 7,500 um, young people that were buried around those schools. Um, and then their families didn't even weren't even told about it. So um, this is this is what's going on here in Canada right now. And so this this work sort of like preceded um, it, it preceded the more public understanding of that being the case of these that these children had died um, at these schools. Um, although there was testimony from survivors of those schools that that had been happening. So it was, it was well known among the indigenous community for a very long time, but it has just recently become more public knowledge due to some scientific way of finding, um, finding remains. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, it's, it's tricky for me to talk about this work right now, apparently, um, but that's, that's the gist of it. And we can continue on to the next one, please. Thank you. Yeah, and again, so in this image, um, I am, uh, <laughs> I always joke with my friends that I just go out and do weird things in the bush, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I'm like really connecting. I'm really literally physically interacting with the land. And I, I just love that. And I love being immersed in the water and I love um, being in the, in the bush and um you know in this image i am i am pressed right against the rock and it was it's just such an amazing experience to actually do this work and feel that like literally feel that connection um in this image as well i'm kind of thinking about ideas of absence and presence and the spirit of that rock and what stories are in that rock um, this rock is also very close to a sacred indigenous site um, in the White Shell area in Manitoba um, called Bannock Point Petroforms. And in that space, um, I, if, for those of you who don't know what petroforms are, um, they're much like petroglyphs where it's like writing on the rock, but these are actually like shapes created out of placed stones, if you can imagine. Um, so that area was the largest um, group of petroforms in all of, I think, North America. I'm not exactly certain about that. Um, but yeah, it's a sacred site and people have been gathering in that place. Um, the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Métis from this area, but also people from all across North America and Turtle Island have been gathering um, to do ceremony in that place. Um, for thousands and thousands of years. So it's a it's really a sacred place. And I have I've had the privilege of connecting with many of the women um, elders in that area and learning some of the stories of these stone petroforms. Um, because each each petroform has a story to go with it and their teachings. They're like the first teachings. Um, and the elders talk about that place as it being their university, like the land is their university. That's where they go to learn the old stories and that's where that knowledge is kept. Um, so this, this stone is near, near that space. Um, and it's really like the bones of the land, like it almost looks like the bones of the land, the way this rock, these rocks come up. And, and as I said, that, you know, that knowledge, that ancient knowledge is there in, in that rock and um, it's really about making that making that connection to that knowledge that's that's really important in in my work and I think also it's it's a really important way for all of us indigenous women and and men um, of reconnecting to these knowledge systems um, you know these old stories these teachings that you know that were relevant for thousands of years and can help us 
you know, really help us kind of move forward and understanding how we can, again, live in balance and in interconnection and interdependence with the land and with each other. Okay, we can go to the next one, please. <clears throat> yeah, so these, these again were uh, taken this summer. And so this is, this is connected to the ribbon bundle that I was holding in the previous image. Um, this is the same, same time that all of this happened. So after holding that bundle, I sort of offered it to the water and then I myself also got into the water. Um, so this is a really beautiful image and I, it's very ethereal and I, I think about it as almost like shifting, shifting worlds or like coming back to, coming back to the place where we come from, right? We come from the water, we are carried in the water of our mother's bodies, um, you know, as we come into this world and it's, it's almost like an umbilical cord that, that red, um, that red ribbon becomes this connection and um, those are kind of some of the things I'm thinking about. But, you know, another thing about this, this photo shoot that I'll share with you guys that is not apparent in the image is that um, this summer here in Manitoba and I think across Canada, I'm not sure about the States, um, was one of the worst droughts ever recorded. Um, many creeks in this area completely dried up that I've never seen dry in my entire life. And I'm 40, don't tell anybody. Um, so in 40 years, I haven't seen any of those creeks dry up and, and many of them did dry up. Um, there were wildfires all across the country. Everything was on fire. There were days here in Manitoba over, over the summer where, you know, we, it was, you could go outside, but the air was so smoky um, that you really had to be careful. Like it was harder to go for a run. It was harder to exercise because the air was so full of smoke because of the drought and the wildfires. Um, so the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, I, I wanted to go back to the water because, because it was a drought and I realized how much we needed the water. Right. And, and re renewed, um, my, concern and care for protecting the water. And so I wanted to make images about that. Um, the day that we went out to take these photographs, um, the entire sky was so smoky um, that you couldn't really see the sun all day long. <clears throat> so I feel like that was, um, you know, it's really, it, you know, it's really, really important that we I mean, I do, I guess I do what I can, right? Um, we do what we can, but it's it's really important that we think about the value of water um, and how we all are implicated in, in working to protect the water uh, against so much pollution and, you know, industrial um, projects and things like that that are constantly um, really sacrificing our water for money. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm going with my work right now. I'm hoping to like do more and more work with and around the water. I would really like to participate in a water walk. Um, again, it's been quiet because of COVID, but um, I really want to join the women in community who walk to protect the water. And um, that's something I would really um, enjoy doing. So we can switch the slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, and this is again that same shoot. As you can see, it's just all that gray you're looking at. It's not fog, it's actually smoke. Um, so it was just a it was a scary year here to think about um, you know how we can how we can move forward together without water. <laughs> it's it's not possible. So <clears throat> again, I think that um, I, I will really continue to work with water and images of water to uh, draw attention to our need to protect it. I think I might be done talking. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> I can invite Tony back in and, and uh, maybe we can do some questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thanks for being so generous with um, you know, a, a window into your 
thought process, your emotions, um, what matters deeply to you, um, how things shift over time. Um, and, you know, when you spoke about the ribbons, the ribbons in the bundle that sit now on the gallery floor between four dresses, four red dresses, you, you talked about them as um, the dresses being keepers of that lifeblood. And it really yeah. helps deep, deepen or expand um, uh, at least my response to the dresses, even as they hang uh, elsewhere because of the, the possibilities and yeah. the potency there. Um, uh, we're going to open up the chat now. Um, please uh, feel free to write comments or questions and I will um, read them to Jamie. Um, first one is, have you included any dresses contributed by families of missing and murdered indigenous women in any of your exhibitions? Yeah, um, I would say that like not always are the dresses donated by families by any stretch. Like they're really donated by anyone and everyone, um, indigenous, non-indigenous, um, and all across the country. But I've had a couple of dresses donated by families. Um, when I when I first first started doing this work, um, I put about six dresses up in a small gallery in Winnipeg and. Um, a family from, I believe, the Paw. This was ten years ago, so please forgive me if my details aren't correct. But um, drove six hours to Winnipeg to donate a dress to support the work because they had lost a daughter um, that they still had not found. Um, so, and I, you know, I've heard stories from from around there as well, and just different stories from people and. I, I think it was that family actually that told me that they called about their daughter being missing and the police said, we don't do family reunions and hung up the phone on them. Um, and they told me that story and said I was free to share that story as I do this work. So that was a really powerful <laughs> story to bring forward so people really have an understanding of, of what families are dealing with when, when they are in crisis. Thank you. Um, another person asked, um, can you speak to the significance of the color red? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, just start by saying, um, I didn't grow up with traditional teachings or ceremony, but I am becoming more and more involved in Anishinaabe and Cree traditional ceremonies and teachings here in Manitoba over the last five, six years or so. Um, but I was always fascinated by the color red, actually, in spite of that. And I, I used to go out into the, into the woods and tie red threads in places and, and kind of use red as a ceremonial thing just for myself, my own, you know, my own spiritual practice at 17 years old. <laughs> um, so it's, it's been something that's definitely been um, there for me throughout. Um, <clears throat> So there's there's so many different meanings you can bring to that color. And I think for myself, I think of it as I was kind of explaining with the ribbon as like our lifeblood. Um, it's what connects all of us. It's what animates us. It's our energy. It's our life force. Um, and that's how I think of the color red. And and but there are like so many different ways of understanding that. But interestingly, like places even very far from each other have very similar understandings and uses for that color and ceremony. So it's, it's quite interesting if you um, kind of start looking into the different ways people understand and read that color. Um, I put up a show of red dresses. Ugh, I have to remember details all the time. I'm not gonna, I put up a show of red dresses somewhere once. <laughs> and uh, a woman, I believe from, Asia somewhere. This is someone I was just like buying something at a store from, but she had seen the red dresses and she had said, um, in my culture, um, red is the color worn by women who come back from the dead to avenge themselves. And this is a story she told. Um, so it's really interesting. And um, another like uh, Dakota woman artist from here in Winnipeg had told me um, that red is the only color the spirits can see. Um, so although I was not taught those things, 
in any explicit way um, growing up, I think that connection to that color makes a lot of sense. And, like, and I'm learning kind of as I go what the power of that, right? Thanks. Um, are the photos digital or film? They're digital. I'm not really a photographer, you guys. I hate to burst your bubble. <laughs> well, I just people love doing my work. People might argue uh, with you about that. They see <laughs> your work. Um, another question: Who is perpetrating the violence now? Yeah, um, that's interesting. So I think like it is extremely complex, but also simple um, issue. And I think that it requires like if if you're coming at this and you have like no sense of what's going on, I think there's like a lot of research that can be done, a lot of reading that can be done, um, kind of like understanding deeper reasons for why this is happening. But <clears throat> um, one of the things you could do actually, if you wanted more information would be to um, read through um, the National Inquiry into Missing Women um, have put out a report um, and I think that's accessible publicly to anyone. And that would be a really interesting read because it looks into the background and um, some of the kind of structural systemic things that are, are, have been happening are currently still happening that are causing these dynamics and making this, um, making this a reality. So, but I, my sort of seed explanation for what's going on is, um, you know, Indigenous women before colonization that were here on this land um, were living in matriarchal societies. Women really were the center of the community. That doesn't mean they ruled over it in a dominating way. It's actually the complete opposite of that. But they, they were the ones who held a lot of power in communities and often had final say on how things run. Um, and my understanding and the way I think about it is settler, the settlers came over here and the systems that they had were in direct opposition to that. And so it was always since the very onset of colonization, um, uh, an effort to eradicate women's voices, to eradicate women's power, um, to take land from communities and and all three of those things are still happening today it's it hasn't changed unfortunately and it that is extremely unfortunate it is just it keeps morphing into a different place and um you know we live in structures that don't punish when women go missing that don't there's there's nobody's being caught nobody's being you know there's there's just no recourse whatsoever. And, um, and I think that's why, why it's happening. Um, but of course, like, I am not a lawyer, I am not a, you know, political scientist, like, there's so many different facets of this, I think that would be really important to research and understand. And I'm even spending time doing that myself, um, as I do this work. But that's, that's kind of the short explanation of how I understand it. Thanks, Jamie. Um, there's a comment here and a desire to get in touch with you. Um, uh, Dr. Polly Walker, um, she writes, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, maybe it's in Cherokee, um, it, I, and her traditional greeting, and then thank you, I am grateful, it's the translation, for the power and beauty of your work honoring uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I would like to be in touch and share about a student exhibit of red dresses at Juniata College, where I am an associate professor emeritus. So I can put you in touch. Yeah, that sounds amazing, yes. Um, next comment. I was struck a few years back at an art history conference in Canada that there was so much more attention, curiosity, and especially knowledge about First Nations art and art history than in the US. Was this a reflection of my lack of knowledge or is there a receptive audience within the arts community in Canada for projects such as yours? Thanks and thanks for the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know, like, I don't know how we could measure such a thing, but, um, but yeah, I, yeah, I don't know why, but like I, the arts, Indigenous arts community across Canada is extremely tight knit um, in doing this work I've got to meet so many artists and 
we're kind of like a small town spread across the whole country because we all know each other and um I don't know it's just there's just such amazing work going on like um I a friend of mine Jamie Isaac uh we started out working at a gallery here in Winnipeg called Urban Shaman Contemporary Art um that was started by a group of Indigenous, I know at least one woman, I'm not sure if it was other people as well, um, but it was an Indigenous only um, gallery run by only Indigenous people. And it's the only one of its kind, I think it might be like the second of its kind possibly across the country. At, um, but a friend of mine, um, Jamie Isaac and I, Jamie Black, <laughs> um, were both working in this gallery at a certain point and she has actually gone on to um, become, she was uh, uh, curating all the Indigenous content at the Winnipeg Art Gallery and so it just, it, it's just amazing the work like people are doing in the arts community and, and the conversations we're having and, and you know, like really examining how even we ourselves as Indigenous artists can, you know, put ourselves into those boxes of co like colonialism and how to get out of them. And like, just all those conversations are happening. It's, it's really, really interesting. And um, I don't know, I, maybe the States just, I'm sure that's happening in corners, you know, I'm sure it's always happening in corners, but it just takes time to build, I think. How can we, as both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, work to form connection to the land and the water in meaningful ways? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, someone asked me last time I gave this talk <laughs> that same question. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I guess for me, it's like, I think it's a shift in understanding the land not as um, a commodity, not as a thing, but as a being, as a presence, as an existing, living, breathing entity. Um, it's almost like the land, like thinking of the land as your like brother or your mother or your, you know, like as it's, it's living. It's, it's not just like for us to dig up and do, it's not a blank page, <laughs> you know? And I think that shift in our, in our minds can really be helpful in creating that connection. And I know that's not like a tangible, you know, what can you do? Like there is a lot you can do. I, I probably can't list all that stuff right now, but, um, but I think that like at the very seed of it, like the, the very first thing is to, is to create that interconnection by, um, creating that relationship with the land where it's a mutual respect and a mutual give and take and a under, wanting to understand um, instead of imposing, um, uh, paying attention and noticing things, uh, seeing how, you know, it's like almost like when you're getting to know someone and you just like, you wanna hear about their everything like that, you can do that with the land too. You can do that with the water too. Um, and spend that time and take that time to like get to know those, you know, those and, and create an intimacy and a connection in that way. And I, I think it's like, yeah, I don't know. I probably said you know, that's, that's where to start in my opinion. <laughs> um, here's another. I have been thinking about your question. What does it mean to embody the red dress? Have any native dancers incorporated the red dress into their regalia, maybe a red jingle dress, as a symbol of healing and connection? Thank you so much for this beautiful talk. I can't wait to visit the gallery. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So actually what has happened, and I've heard, I always hear stories about these dresses because I'm often not even there and amazing things are happening. So um and I don't even know the full backstory of this, but a red jingle dress was created um, and it was taken to powwows all across Canada. Um, and I also heard from someone, um, this is all just in passing, like people, um, I heard that a red dress jingle dress dance was I can't remember where it was, but it was somewhere in the States. And I think there were over like 300, 400 um, women in red jingle dress. Yeah, you know about it, Tony? Because I, I don't know yeah. everything about it. Yeah. 
Um, yes, and actually, uh, last semester I showed a video of it and an interview with a young woman who led it. It was hundreds of people in New Mexico at a gathering in New Mexico. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so powerful. Like, oh my goodness, I can't even believe that. Like, wow. I know I heard that. And yeah, so yeah, people are people are taking, you know, um, bringing this into their into ceremony, which is super powerful. Thank you. I, Jamie, could you talk about your emotions as you are creating these pieces? Does your anger seethe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like for the series they tried to bury us I was in an actually really bad emotional place myself at that time and I was feeling that way like I was feeling um like I was being silenced and I was kind of like oh good luck because I'm a seed you know like good luck burying me because I'm a seed and like I was thinking about that as I was doing that work and like just allowing the land to kind of like give me back that energy and like reaching through dark like a seed does to like get to a different place and to break through you know the land like the soil and and grow again and and you know all those feelings and so like sort of embodying those emotional experiences is so is so cathartic and so powerful um to make those connections and and I think it's just yeah it's just like it becomes like a way of releasing um anything that's really heavy and like being able to release that through doing this work through the body and like through the land and um I definitely like I definitely heal myself and my emotional self by by going through that process of doing this work Um, question about, have you thought through the histories in showing the work in the United States, having a body like form in the red dresses hanging from a tree where it uh, typically might be associated with lynching mm. the death of black men in the past? Yeah, that's really interesting because um, a couple of people have like brought that up. And I mean, when I created this project, I like, I guess I'm not super close to that history. So I didn't kind of have it in mind as I was creating this work. Um, and I wonder in what ways like we can, I, you know, honor that history and show care for that also horrific history um, while still being able to bring forward the history of the indigenous women. and. I think that as an artist, I would definitely be open to having a conversation about how, you know, how that could happen and if that could happen. Thank you. Um, I visited Professor Jeremy Swift's seminar on Julian the Apostate the last non-Christian ruler of the Roman Empire, when he and his troops attempted to conquer the peoples north of Greece, all of whom he called Gauls. He was um, meshing dozens, if not hundreds of different peoples together who had different cultures, religion, religions, and identities. I just tell you this to let you know that abuse of indigenous peoples by conquering armies goes back to deep antiquity as well, sadly. Thanks mm. for your work and your lovely explanation of its impact. I am so impressed. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Are there any other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. I, can, I can save the chat for you, Jamie, and share. So you sure, can. yeah. And if anyone like if anyone's interested in getting in touch, um, you can definitely uh, hopefully get in touch with Tony or Susan and they can connect you to me if you guys have any further questions that we didn't get to. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. Thanks again for both um, offering your work to us here on campus and spending this time with us to, to hear from you as a, 
as an artist, as an indigenous woman who has, you know, started a journey that you are continuing and you've you've led us onto the path for a little bit of it. Thank you very much. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you, Susan. Hi, everyone, thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>